Thank you for joining us on another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. My name is Danny Ladoni, and today we're talking with Rogelio Briones. He is a retired school teacher who also is a cultural historian and artist. In today's interview, he talks about his time at Adams State during the late 70s, his involvement as a faculty member, faculty senate, and what we end up talking about largely is the Chicano movement at Adams State, what one might consider a forgotten history of the institution. Rogelio's interview is wide-ranging, and he often also talks about the national and international connections to issues that affect students and faculty right here at Adams State. So, without further ado, here is Rogelio Briones. First of all, I crossed the U.S.-Mexico border illegally for about 40 years, uh, claiming to be a U.S. citizen when I was actually a Mexican citizen. So I was born in... uh, Aguascalientes, which is about 200 miles uh, in central Mexico, up from Mexico City. My grandfather migrated as a bracero, you know, up to the United States and stayed in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And then after that, the whole family followed and we followed. We lived in Juarez for about four years. And then in 62, uh, I crossed into the United States. I went to school in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, I still have family there. Um, when I graduated from, from Mayfield High School, I uh, enrolled at New Mexico State University. Uh, and, and that was the, the first time they got, I got involved in, in the Chicano movement. Because even in Las Cruces, even though it's 40 miles from the U.S. border, Mexico border, we were sheltered from, from all that, even though I was in the middle of the Chicano movement. In high school, you never hear about that. New Mexico State is the first time that that I got involved with with sit-ins, demanding things from from the university. And then uh, in 73, I decided to become a teacher. I joined a program called Teacher Corps. So they sent me a letter saying, yeah, we're interested in interviewing you. Come on up. And I go, well, it's not an Indian reservation, but it's, it's kind of a third world feel to it. So was that your first introduction to the San Luis Valley, was through this teacher corps and through this program at Adams State? In 1973, I had never been past Española, New Mexico. So in 1973, you know, I I came up, I interviewed at Adams State, and I got accepted. And then at the beginning of the fall semester, you know, I came up. They offered me to start an art program because I'm an art major in San Luis. So I go, oh, yeah, I'll take it. So I ended up in San Luis, and that's how I learned to become a teacher, you know. So I came in 73, and 75 I graduated, you know, I graduated. Then I did a year of graduate studies at Adams State in the art department. So I got my master's degree in three semesters. Then I applied for the Ford Foundation, and I was selected as a fellow. So I went traveling for a year. Then in 1977, I came back to visit the campus and uh, that's when a job opening happened. But it was on soft monies. It was called the CAMP program, College Assistant Migrant Program. Uh, Which is still around today? Well, it, it was defunded in 1981, and now it's back on campus. But it was a good program because we, we were taking uh, students from a migrant farm worker background, taking them out of the fields. That was the idea. And bringing them into college and mentoring them so they would have success at least for the first year, the freshman year. Uh, So we were bringing in about 100 students a year to Adams State on that program, you know. What was that like at Adams State? What was going on politically, culturally, socially? Well, there was a lot more activism at that time. Um, The social movements were in decline, but... There was still a lot of activism, especially on campuses. And then, of course, you know, the the whole situation that happened up in Boulder with Reyes Martinez and the Boulder Seven. Uh, I think there were six people that that were killed, supposedly because they're messing with a car bomb. But I think the, the real story is that the government killed them. 
So there was that activism that filtered all the way from Boulder down to Adams State. And of course, we had, <clears throat> there was a, a numerous uh, organization on campus, United Mexican American Students. We were sponsoring conferences uh, on the land, the land grants. We, we were, uh, for Cinco de Mayo, we would actually, we marched up and down uh, Main Street, uh, Alamosa. And, and really what we were demanding was that, you know, Adam State be more inclusive, that it start teaching our history, that it should strengthen the Chicano Studies Department. There were a few classes being taught, but the whole thing, it, it was never embraced, and, and that's been proven out because, you know, there's, there's a skeleton of a department left. But in those days, we had a, a fuller department. We were, we were fighting for that. We were demanding that those classes be offered. And uh, Can I ask just uh, why sure. you wanted those things? Why was it important? What was wrong with the kind of history that you were being offered? What was wrong with the, the, the lack of inclusion, as you would put it? Because if our history, our contributions, our culture is not taught, that means that we don't matter that we don't, basically we don't exist. That we remained in the background, you know? We're not appreciated. We were here first, you know? We, we were here first. The Native Americans were here first. But during the Chicano movement, what I loved about the Chicano movement was that, especially in California, southern New Mexico, Texas, and parts of Arizona, the Chicano movement reattached itself back to Mexico, to our ancestral roots, to our indigenous roots. Before that, <clears throat> we were all in denial. I remember Las Cruces, before the Chicano movement came in, when we were in, in the schools, in the public schools, uh, we were trying to be as white as possible. We would even uh, pronounce our names, we, we would anglicize our names. Instead of Padilla, it became Padilla. Instead of Briones, it became Briones. Thinking back on it, we were shamed into it. Because again, we didn't matter. Our history wasn't being taught in the public schools. So the Chicano movement kind of awakened everything and said, wait a minute, we do matter. So you retrieve, or at least I retrieved into a shell. But then the Chicano movement allowed me to come out and look back at my ancestry my family, my traditions, my culture, and rediscover the beauty and the strength of it. So the Chicano movement allowed us to re-champion, you know, our ancestors, our family, our grandfathers, grandmothers, and say, look, look, look at the, be the beauty that they possess, the knowledge that they possess, and we were in denial of that because we were in the dominant Anglo culture. As simple as that. So it sounds like there was a movement at Adams State during the mid to late 70s um, for more uh, inclusive coursework, uh, studies, anything else that you can remember that were sort of specific demands or concerns that the students had at that time? We were demanding that, that for example, more people of color be hired as faculty, you know? Uh, and then, other demands that they were more difficult to prove was that if they did hire a person of, of color, that uh, they would actually champion the program. You know, uh, there was a term in those days, it's still around, vendido, meaning sold out, you know. So if you, if you were too, quote-unquote, radical, or too much of an activist, they wouldn't hire you. They wanted to hire somebody with a Hispanic surname or a Mexican surname that was, uh, that would toe the line. You know, and we were going like, well, you know, we have these candidates and these people are, are, have great potential, but they threatened the university and they would not hire. They would rather select somebody that was inferior and in our opinion, but that they could manage and basically tell them what to do, and you know. So on the Adam State campus at this point, there is <clears throat> a, a bronze statue of Joe Vigil, uh, famed athletics coach at Adam State. Um, 
is is that not representative of that history? Uh, is is there other figures that perhaps should be recognized more? Um, talk a little bit about about that. Well, first of all, I think it's good that Joby he accomplished what he accomplished. You know, at least he has the last name Vigil, you know, and he's from Antonito. That, that's, that's great. Uh, and he's known worldwide. You know, you can't deny his accomplishments. Uh, for whatever reasons, there were people on campus of Hispanic surnames that, that never uh, supported what the Chicanos were doing on campus, students and faculty. Too radical, too uh, unreasonable? I, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I can't speak for them. What, what I'm thinking is, you know, uh, I have a job. You know, I better be careful what I do because I want to maintain my job. Wait, so you're trying to tell me that there are people who have a job, they're comfortable with it, and because of that, they're not willing to put their neck out on the line once in a while for something they that, believe that's, in? That's pretty universal, isn't it? That goes beyond racial boundaries. You know, that's... The, you know, that's labor versus management, you know, uh, people that, you know, some people believe that, uh, man, you can't fault them, you know, they have a family to support, and, and to them that's more important than, yeah, we understand that this Chicano, the Chicanos, what they're saying is correct, and there's a lot of abuses, uh, more could be done, but at this point I'm not ready to to take a stand and and stand next to them and demand it because you know uh, I I feel comfortable where, where I'm at. It's always been that way, you know. We're back to the vendidos, the ones that sell out, and you know. Uh, the, another term was the coconuts, you know, brown on the outside but white in the inside. You know, it's it's always you know it's always been that way. I'd heard the term Oreo before as the derogatory term for black people yeah, that have a sure. similar um, mm -hmm. ethnic attitude. Yeah. Well, you know, that's that's just the way human nature is, you know. Uh, so let me uh, follow up then. Adam State is a designated HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution, and that's a term that they're very proud of, and it allows them access to certain pools of funding, and it certainly also helps in terms of their, their branding and their mission and their identity. Um, but there are some people that have called into question uh, what that really means and if Adam State's priorities are actually reflective of the, uh, the HSI status that they have. You talked earlier about how there seems to be the skeleton of, of something that, that may not have a lot of uh, substance to it. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the both the claim of Adam State as an HSI, but also from your perspective, what that really translates to, or or perhaps what it might be lacking. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, before I talk on that, let's go back to the statue of Joey Hill. You know, I, I'm a major in art. I started out as a painter at New Mexico State, and then. I really got into sculpture. Uh, and I bring that back up because uh, if you look at all the sculpture throughout the campus, I don't think any of it was done by people of color. So only sculpture done by whites uh, merits being displayed on campus so future generations of students can witness it. Um, look at the statue that's in front of Richardson Hall. If that doesn't, what that tells me is, this is a white institution and it's going to remain a white institution. What statue are you referring to? Uh, Tell us the what cowboy, it is. and I, and I, and I, his name escapes me, the, the artist's name. Right. But there's, there's a statue in front of Richardson Hall of a white cowboy. It's an Anglo. It's not indigenous, it's not Mexican, it's not Hispanic, you know, and they commissioned that, I believe, on purpose. So, so again, I, you know, our art is not, doesn't merit being exhibited, you know. Uh, 
So it all goes hand in hand. And and, and I don't know how this this how they, this designation of a Hispanic servant institution. What I've said several times in public addressing that point is yeah, there might be a Hispanic servant institution, but all the Hispanics are in maintenance. The majority are in maintenance. You know, they have a bunch of people of color, you know, cleaning the, the grounds, but they're very reluctant to, uh, to hire, to hire Hispanics or Mexicans to, to teach, you know, positions of authority in the administration. Uh, I remember in those days in the 70s, they, they would have a search and they would hire somebody from Alabama. And you go like, wait a minute, there's, there's applicants <clears throat> that deserve to be considered that are from here, from the valley, you know. They have something to offer, but I guess they were too threatened by that. So they, they would end up bringing somebody from the South, and and probably they were good people, but but it just seems that, that somehow locals should have some kind of a priority, you know, especially if, if you have the credentials, you know. I almost can imagine what you're talking about. Uh, so let me just ask then, um, what would uh, a statue of someone like Reyes Martinez mean to the campus, what would it mean to you if you walked onto Adam State tomorrow and you saw a statue of someone that represented more of the Chicano movement, and maybe a statue that was created by, you know, a uh, Hispanic or um, a Native artist? Native Americans being a, allowed a chance to be present on campus, it's amazing. And I've said this in public also. We live 80 miles from one of the oldest Native American communities that been con has been continuously inhabited Where would for that millennia, be? Taos Where? Pueblo. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> you follow with all these other pueblos that have been here forever, you know? Uh, the Apache people, the Diné people, the Navajo, the Hopis, uh, and yet, Adam State, I, I don't even know if they offer any any classes, any Native American study classes. There's certainly, that they don't have any, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, Native American faculty, you know. I mean, they're missing the boat. And I know it takes money to institute programs, but, but really, you know, uh, they're missing the boat. Uh, but I think that's deliberate, you know, going back this is a white institution that was founded by Billy Adams. And what I've heard, and I don't have the proof in front of me, but he, he was a card-carrying member of the KKK. And then later on, he, he tried to fight against it to cover his own tracks, you know. Uh, yeah, I did some fact checking, and it seems like the history shows that there was in Colorado um, during the early and mid twenties a resurgent movement of Klansmen in the uh, in the the state legislature, and Billy Adams is famed to have been one of the people to oppose them. But what you're suggesting is that prior to that, Adams had some involvement with yeah the before he became a governor. You know, I mean, you you have to remember that. Uh, the Alamosa was one of the most racist, it still is, cities. It's not, it's been what, in the 90s, I think, where the whole community was flooded uh, with uh, white supremacist literature. I don't know if you remember that. You know, talk to Ted McNeil Smith. He, he, he actually convened a panel on campus to to dispel, oh no, we're, we're not a racist community. You, all of us here, uh, you know, we're inclusive and, you know, I don't know what these white supremacists were thinking by flooding our community with this racist literature. And I'm going, I think Alamosa has a history of deep-seated racism. Look at all the institutions in the valley. Who controls them? Adam State's controlled by whites. All the banks are controlled by whites. 
you know the m most of the the school districts are controlled by whites mormon whites that's a new trend they're they're taking over all, all the superintendentships in, in the valley uh, do you think it's some collective effort to do so, or do you think that's just the natural outgrowth of a systemic no, I, racism? No, I think I think the, the, the Mormons are going to protect themselves. I think they're entrenched at Adam State, specifically uh, in the athletic department. You know, uh, I mean, there's there's, there's all these connections. Uh, they hire. I was I was saying earlier they hire a professor from Alabama, they come in, and all of a sudden, the the spouses of these people that come in as professors to Adam State, all of a sudden, they get employed at the school district in Alamosa. And the locals here go, well, I need a teaching job, and oh, we, we don't have any. But they do have to accommodate. There's a direct pipeline between the athletic department and all the, the high school athletic departments, you know. It's all connected. Well, there's certainly no question that in recent years, if not recent decades, Adam State's priorities have really focused on uh, growing and maintaining athletics facilities and programs. Um, and, you know, the university gives the argument that that's been one of the, the key areas of growth and enrollment and um, even retention. Um, but it seems to be that making one set of choices, like supporting all of these athletics programs means that there's an opportunity cost to these other choices, like doing more with regard to what we're talking about here with, uh, with Hispanic programs, uh, with uh, native indigenous programs and studies, Chicano studies. Um, can you talk just a little bit about if you were Adam State president for a day or maybe even for a few years, uh, what would, would be some of the things that you would consider shifting around, changing, adjusting? Well, look, look. Let me let me just tell you a personal story that happened at Adam State. Um, again, we were working <clears throat> on federal monies, soft monies. This was uh, in the late seventies. Yeah, from when I was working there, I worked from nineteen seventy-seven until eighty-one, um, and that's when I became uh, faculty sponsor of. Uh, the UMAS group, United Mexican American Students. Uh, we used to meet in the old Rex gym. Now it's a, a sports facility where people go to work out. But in those days, it was abandoned. So, you know, that's where they put the... Uh, it's in bad shape, but so that's where they put the Chicanos. You know, yeah, you guys can go and meet in there. But anyway, uh, it turns out that the student said, well, you guys, sh me and another colleague of mine said, you guys should run for faculty senate, you know. So we go, okay. So we put in, we we wanted to <clears throat> to run for, for the position <clears throat> of faculty representative on the student senate. <clears throat> well, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the president of ASNF, a student, I think he was a senior or something, that came to me and he goes, you can't run because you, you're not really faculty. You're working on soft monies. And I go, really? And I go, that's true. And I go, well, you know what? They have been deducting faculty fees from me since I've been here. So you've been paying ASNF dues, and so right. by that faculty, argument... Faculty, it, it was fac it, it's, it's titled in your paycheck, it says faculty fees or dues. Mm -hmm. And they deducted, I don't know, ten, fifteen dollars a month. So I go, so if I'm not faculty and I can't run because I'm on soft monies, then I'm gonna demand my faculty fees back for all these years you've been deducting from me. And I'm gonna advise my colleagues to do the same. Well, the same president, uh, student president came back and he goes, It's okay, you can run. I go, Oh, okay, well thank you. Well, we won by a landslide. So, so you became a faculty senator? Right. Okay. So we're sitting and we had where you dispense funds because you, you collect all this money on, on student fees mm -hmm. that the Senate manages. Right. So 
we had funding uh, requests. So we're sitting there, and the first one that, one of the first ones that came was the athletic department. They came and said, <clears throat> traditionally, out of students' fees, we re in those days, we receive, we get funded by the tune of $21,000 out of student fees for the athletic department. We go, wait a minute, why? Well, you know, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. We have all this. Uh, and I go, why are you using student fees to pay things that should come from, you know, state monies? So being newly elected, we, we kind of rattle our sabers and said, okay, wait a minute. So we made them jump through hoops. And, of course, uh, they were all concerned. They were going to deny those $21,000. So eventually the vote came down and it, it was approved. But by that time, I'm sure that the people in the athletic department went directly to the president and said, you know, these Briones and this other guy, Gomez, Placido Gomez, uh, you don't realize what they're doing. They're putting us, they're holding our feet to the fire. And so that led to our demise. And, and unfortunately, our, our grant was due that year so my suspicion is that they, they didn't support it. They said, you know, we've had enough of these guys. We don't want the federal grant to continue the camp program. So we were defunded and we were out the door. So you served as a faculty senator for one year? Uh, probably less than that. So that kind of answers the question, if you were president at Adams State, well, would you be run out of town <laughs> for your... Radical well, ideas? No, not necessarily. But I, I mean, it should be that that uh, that you should treat all the departments equally. You know, I mean, maybe that's you know too idealistic. But I mean, you know, I think I think uh, academics should have some kind of priority. Why do you think that? Well, because look, we were pretty progressive in those days. We brought in conferences on land grants. We organized the first. Native American powwow that happened at, at the old Rex gym. It's never been done before. We had about 20 drums, youths, Apaches, Navajos. They came, you know, it's the only time that it's been done. And we did it. We, the Chicanos, and with with the help of, of uh, the few Native students that, that are on campus, we organized that. But another thing we did was... Uh, we invited Jose Angel Gutierrez, Reyes Lopez Tijerina was on campus, Thomas Banyana, the, the Hopi interpreter. But we also were instrumental in bringing in Harry Edwards, uh, Dr. Harry Edwards. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Tell uh, us a little bit about who he is. Well, he's a black activist. He is the man that organized the 1968 Black Olympic boycott in Mexico City. He was the man responsible for John Carlos and Tommy Smith when they went up to receive their medals at the ceremony. They put on a black glove and raised their fist and said, you know, equality for, for everyone, including blacks. Well, he came on campus. Uh, I think he's from San Jose State. I don't know if he's still there or he's retired now. But he came on campus, and what he talked about was how... Even in a smaller institution like Adams State, <clears throat> black athletes are being used and then discarded for the benefit for the benefit of uh, of the institution. Look what's happening in Missouri now. Finally, the the the, the black uh, football players stood up. You know, so. That's nationwide where these institutions are making millions of dollars off of these, you know. And then they give, <clears throat> they give <clears throat> these black uh, athletes the illusion that somehow they're going to go and make millions of dollars like, like uh, Michael Jordan by joining the pro leagues. Well, that, that's, you know, that's a very small percentage. So that's what... Dr. Edwards came to say, look, educate yourself. Educate your mind. Don't concentrate just 
on your physical prowess, you know, educate yourself because not all of you are going to be able to make it to the pro leagues. And so that's what I'm saying, you know. And I think I said it last night, you know, one of the problems even at Adam State is that athletics wag the dog, you know. I mean, why? Should be where, you know, uh, the Adam State should be all-inclusive. It should concentrate on, on expanding people's minds, bringing in, you know, uh, different points of view, different worldviews onto campus. Uh, it seems to me like that that's not one of their priorities. So if I was president, you know, I would say, you know, let's treat everybody equally. Yeah, sure, you know, athletics will have a place at the table, but so should everybody else, you know. I mean, it would seem to me that, and we might have mentioned this before, um, that socio-politically speaking, sports is safe. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a controlled environment. There's not any demands being made on the power structure. It's a battle narrative to it, with, especially with sports like football. But there's, you know, this strong cohesion behind your leadership with the mascot and the team and the school spirit. So it really encourages and reinforces existing structures of power. Whereas, you know, if you were to start recognizing, you know, politically active figures, activists, people like that, what the institution would be doing is reinforcing the idea that power can be challenged, that administration has to answer to the people that it claims to serve. Yeah, you know, that's true. But what I found out about, see, I retired from Centennial High School and... I was a union activist. I was president, local president of the union there for several years. Uh, what we found out throughout the valley, and this, you know, uh, is that uh, the people in the athletic departments, even in high school levels, become too powerful. You know, they 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 come together and they protect their, their turf, and they go directly to the superintendent, or in this case, the president. Yeah, the athletic director at Adams State does report directly to the president, yeah. which surprised some people because you wouldn't think necessarily that the uh, the chain of command would be that direct or that it would be that close an appointment. Well, see, you know, back to uh, when we got elected to the Senate, we pointed out to all of them, he goes, look, you have all these administrative cabinets, different levels, the vice presidential cabinet and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, you realize that you don't have any people of color. So immediately when we brought that to their attention, you know, they started appointing people of color to, the, to those administrative cabinet positions. But it wasn't us, the activists. It was somebody that they deemed to be safe. Was it the coconuts? Yeah, yeah. They're the ones that ended up. So they benefited from our activism, you know. So it sounds like in some ways they co-opted the shell or the appearance of what you were asking for almost as a way to then dismiss the substance of what you were asking for. Yeah, you know, they, 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 uh, they pacify you by, you know, by saying, now what do you want? Look, you pointed it out, and now we have so-and-so here, so, you know, you're on, you don't have an argument anymore. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, it, it, that's, it's always been that way. But, you know, Adam State is good. It's good for the Valley. Uh, and it's not going to go away soon, uh, you know. Uh, I enjoy going to some of the programs on campus. That's the only time I'm on campus. Some, once in a while, I'll go to the library to look something up and uh, look for a book or, or, or something. But that's about it, you know. I don't, you know. Uh, it really hasn't changed from when we were there. And, you know, after we were dismissed from from the Student Senate, uh, they dismantled UMAS, you know, because they were, quote-unquote, too radical. Remind us that acronym, UMAS. Uh, United Mexican American Students. Mm -hmm. uh, and they kept El Parnaso. I think El Parnaso uh, is still there. So we go, well, you don't have any, any Chicano uh, clubs. Well, we have El Parnaso, but that's basically a language. You know, it's pretty meek. Uh, I mean, with all your respect to them, you know, 
uh, Spanish language club. The, they had been around before Umas, but they instructed a person of color, I won't mention his name, to be in charge. And they basically told them, <clears throat> don't you ever allow another student group like Umas, you know, on campus. We will not charter them, you know. If we're going to have any student, Chicano student groups, they better be, they better behave and toe the line, you know. And mm -hmm. It's been that way ever since. Uh, they, they, they attacked me personally because uh, I was I was tutor coordinator for uh, the camp program. You know, I, I was in charge of hiring tutors to help our students with classes, and we had a tutoring center and stuff. So they attacked me personally that I didn't know what I was doing, that that I was running the tutoring program wrong, and blah blah blah. It was just an attempt to intimidate me. To, you know, because I was the one standing up and saying, wait a minute, why are you trying to get rid of the Chicano, uh, of Chicano studies? What, what's going on? What, what have we done? What, we, we haven't done anything wrong, you know? Well, it seems like Adam State, like many other institutions, I would imagine, has a little bit of an interest in homogeny. So if you're going to stand up and you're going to challenge things or you're going to question the way things are run, uh, there's this institutional pushback to, you know, isolate the individual and then eliminate the, the person rather than addressing the problem. It sounds like that's something you experienced. Well, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a small institution. It really is. We're not in New York City and we're not, you know, we're, or even in Denver where all this culture comes in, in different points of view. You know, it's it's a rural area, and and. Uh, but it's a rural area with history, right? It's a rural area with indigenous roots and with uh, deep-seated cultural identity. Yeah, but all that's all that's ignored. Look, you have the Fort Garden Museum that champions uh, the Indian killer Kit Carson. You know, I mean, I mean, they had a billboard right before you got to Blanca to the post office. It says. Kit Carson served here. They were championing him. And if you look at his history, I mean, he was brutal with Native Americans in particular, you know, the Navajo, when he went to those, into Kenyon the Shea and butchered the elderly women, children, you know. And yet, here he is being championed. Pike Stockade. Basically, Zebulon Pike was committing a criminal act, and he knew what he was doing. You know, he said he was lost. They, they, he was scouting so they could steal the land. The Forgotten Museum, Park Stockade are championing Anglo-Saxon values, history. And yet, the Native Americans that are still here, they have been here forever. The first Western Europeans to come into the valley, they happen to be of Hispanic descent. And, you know, uh, there's, there's no memorial to them. Again, we don't exist. Why are your contributions valuable? The UN Act, all these historical sites, but our contributions that predated that, if you want to go on that, you know, there's no mention of us. It's like we never came through here, we, you know, and that's really, that's really what it is. I mean, we certainly can't change the past, right? But it does sound like there are specific, rectifiable, uh, issues that you're raising today that Adam State could work on moving forward, right? Well, sure. They should be at the forefront of inclusiveness, of accepting everybody, you know, instead of paying lip service about being a Hispanic servant institution, they should, you know, they should actually, you know, hire more faculty, uh, strengthen the Chicano Studies program, put some artwork on campus, you know, uh, we tried to institute a mariachi program. It became very popular. But the music department, it was like pulling teeth. They're going like, why do we have to have this mariachi music on campus? It didn't, didn't take, it lasted for a while. There were some classes being taught at night, part-time, but it wasn't embraced. It, it, it'll never be embraced. I mean, just, you know, 
I mean, when, when will be the first time that they'll have uh, a Hispanic president? Uh, several of the candidates <laughs> were Hispanic. I mean, there's certainly much to oh, do yeah, about well, yeah. our first female president, right? But yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Because Adam State, in that sense, mirrors the United States, you know. The United States is controlled by rich white males, and, and uh, I think that's the case at Adam State also, you know. It's, uh, you know. And I, and I think that I like to say in public is this. What's really threatening is that the hemisphere genetically is getting darker as we speak, and that's the most intimidating thing. Donald Trump realizes that he sounds like the KKK. You know the rhetoric from the KKK? Yeah, there's <clears throat> several people who are prominent, you know, KKK members or white supremacists have, have endorsed Donald Trump for president. Sure. What they say is, this is not the land that my father remembered. And I'm going, why don't you go back and say, this is not the land that the Native Americans remember, you know? No, they, they, they want to frame it in a specific time period. You know, since we started being racist, we can't be as racist as we used to be. Well, I think that's what's most intimidating to him, that those days are, are coming to an end. And it's, it's ironic because it's because of the actions of the United States. The United States, in my lifetime, has been the most violent, most abusing terrorist country since I've been alive throughout the world not to mention in Mexico, Central America. Why do we have a Mayan community in Alamosa? Because Ronald Reagan was protecting the interests of the United Fruit Company and other corporations there were in Nicaragua, Guatemala, El Salvador, and they were inflicting through these puppet governments, they were inflicting all this pain on this and, and native communities. So they go like, we gotta get out of here, we're gonna die. You talk to the to the, the Mayan people here, and they'll tell you horror stories about how their grandparents were killed, butchered, you know, by the army that was supported directly by the United States government. The, this so-called war on, on drugs that's being funded by the United States government, giving Mexico millions and millions of dollars, that's just led to, you know, more people uh, getting killed. But, again, you know, I think just through sheer numbers, I came in 73, you can definitely see a change in the valley. There are more Mexicans all over the place. Much to dismay of probably uh, even the Chicanos that lived here, the Hispanics, the ones that claim to be pure Spanish, they probably don't want all these mojaos or wetbacks around, you know. Can you give us a quick distinction between the term Hispanic and the term Chicano? Like why aren't we a Chicano serving institution, Adam State? What would that mean? I think the, the term Chicano, uh, Mexico, shouldn't be Mexico, it should be Mexico, because it's from the word Mexica, Mexica. So we're Mexicanos. What is Mexica? Mexica uh, are the Aztecs. Uh, they call themselves Mexica Tenochca Aztecat. When the country came into being, they go, well, we, you know, we're going to call ourselves Mexicanos, Mexicans. So I think the Chicano movement trying to reattach itself back to the ancestral indigenous cultures and the, the history of Mexico, they didn't want to call themselves Mexicans because they weren't Mexicans, you know. So they, I think they came, they coined that term based on, instead of Mexicano, they go me. Chicano, Chicano. Ha, ha, so Chicano, Chicano tends to emphasize and recognize the indigenous heritage, right? Right. Whereas Hispanic seems to really call its allegiances to Spain, to you know the the European powers that colonized the Americas. Yeah, and and it's based on a myth. Juan de Oñate, when he came to establish the 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 colony, he made his fortune in Zacatecas. He enslaved hundreds of indigenous people to work in the silver mines. That's how he made his fortune. When he had enough money, he went to Mexico City and paid the viceroy and say, look, I want to go explore in New Mexico. Would you give me the papers? Because if you didn't have proper papers, they would come and the, the authority would come and arrest you, the, you know. 
So he was able to pay the viceroy, and the viceroy said, yeah, go ahead. So according to the book, The Last Conquistador, by Mark Simmons, he went around and says, hey, I got the contract. Let's go. So he went around the Zacatecas area trying to recruit Spanish families. And most of them that decided to come up with him, they go, well, I don't know if I was born in Spain. I think, I, no, I don't think so. There was one person that claimed that they were born in Spain. Edward James almost says, we were born, we the Chicanos were born when, when our Spanish father raped our Indian mother. And really that's what happened, you know. Uh, since Columbus arrived on these lands, the preferred age of women were nine to 12 year olds. That's who the Spanish were abusing. So by the time that Oñate recruited Spanish families to come up to New Mexico, we were already a mixed race. Oñate himself was born in Mexico. There were all Mexicans that came up. Yet, when they got up here, you know, these myths about we're Spanish, we're Spanish, we're Spanish, you know. So if you want to argue it, more Native Americans came on the expedition than so-called pure Spanish. So on that basis, it sounds like there's a historical problem with the term Hispanic serving institution. The, the, the whole concept of an HSI probably should be walked back and looking at the origins of, of who these people even are that, that Adam State and other institutions claim to be serving. Yeah, but, but in this area, uh, they don't want to do that because in northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, the original inhabitant of inhabitants of this land have created this myth. They're somehow they're purer than anybody else. So if Adam State wanted to change it back, in fact, I argued, I went to City Market one day and I go, wait a minute, what happened? You used to say Mexican foods. Why in the heck is it now Hispanic foods? And I go, look, I went over there looking for food from Spain and all of it is from Mexico. Chile, corn. What the heck's going on? Why? So in other words, all the food is still from Mexico. Yeah. But the sign at the front of the aisle says Hispanic foods. Yeah, and they changed that deliberately because it's more acceptable. The term Mexican is just too radical oh, to use? Well, no, it, or it has negative connotations attached to it. It's funny that uh, the sign of an aisle in city market can actually conjure up this much historical you know, context and, um, and investigation. Well, why? I mean, you know, why? Why did they change it? Somebody at the headquarters said, you know, we're insulting Hispanics by calling them Mexican. Maybe they weren't getting enough Donald Trump supporters to go down the aisle and <laughs> shop there, right? I don't, I don't know what it was, but, but that was sure disappointing for me. <laughs> I was going like, wait a minute, what do we do now? We, can't, we don't even deserve an aisle. <laughs> We thought, wow, okay, never mind. Uh, and that's really, because Adam State is good for the Valley. It's good for Alamosa. It should be more inclusive. I'm not here trying to destroy it or get rid of it. No, I'm here to say, hey, in, be more inclusive. Include us in real substantive decisions that affect the campus. Let's come together. And that's one of the, the things that Native American beliefs teach you, you know, we're all humans. At some level, we're, we're just energetic beings, and at that level, there's no discrimination. Good luck to, to you, and good luck to Adam State. Uh, it's unfortunate that all this stuff happened, especially with your situation. It's really unfortunate, uh, and I wish you good luck, and I wish Adam State good luck. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, no problem. Okay, very good. All right. Mm -hmm.